So with chapter 14, this is going to be a continuation of sorts of chapter 13, where chapter 13 was all about first contact and conquering and the creation of these various colonies. Chapter 14 is going to be some of the long-term consequences, especially the economic consequences of the creation of these colonies that Europe did. The biggest one here, honestly, is obviously going to be the Atlantic slave trade. And this is going to be amazingly and enormously significant. In addition to this, just in general, and this also has to do with not only with the colonies, but also other trade connections, is, is that the Europeans were increasingly prominent in long distance trade. But the thing is, is that other people are also important, even though it seems as though we're spending a lot of time concentrating on what the Europeans did. The reality is that, again, you know, like I've said a number of times and will say for the next couple chapters, the Europeans are not at the top of the heap. They are, at best, attempting to play catch up with a lot of these other civilizations that we've talked about before. The Chinese, the Ottomans, the Mughals, um, you know, I mean, a lot of these other empires that we've had contact with and will continue to develop. So not only are the Europeans going to be big in international trade, but there's also going to be all of these other players here as well that in a lot of ways are going to be just as significant, if not even more significant than the Europeans. Commerce and empire were the two forces that drove globalization between 1450 and 1750. In fact, you want to put down here next to D, you can put it, probably put this in this space right here. You want to put down that empire will become a major force in the 19th century. Empire will become a major force in the 19th century. So in a lot of ways, we're almost going to see a sequel to this colonization and a duplication of a lot of the consequences here. Just, you know, another hundred or so years after this round of colonization ends. So one of the big things that we have talked about before, and really one of the major motivating forces for the Europeans to go out and explore and ultimately discover the Americas is the fact that the Europeans wanted commercial connections with Asia. Remember, it's Asia that has all of the good stuff that the Europeans want. And it's not just going to be China, it's going to be India, it's going to be the Ottoman Empire, it's going to be the Spice Islands of what is now today Indonesia. I mean, there's a whole bunch of goods that this particular part of the globe has that the Europeans find very, very desirable. In fact, you want to put down here next to that unlabeled sentence, you want to put down what they created in the Americas was a consequence of this. What they created in the Americas was a consequence of this. Remember, the whole reason why the Spanish in particular sail to the West is the Portuguese already have all of the trade routes sailing to the East to get an all water route into some of these Asian markets, in particular India. And Spain just wants to see if they can find another way to get access to these exact same locations or at least to neighboring locations. The motivation above all was the desire for spices. Although honestly, there's gonna be other Eastern products that were also sought like silk and porcelain and jade and you know, a lot of other products also coming out of uh, you know, India and China as well, tea, you know, like that for example, uh, as well. But you know, remember, and you wanna put down here next to number two, cause this is, you know, one of the big reasons for the desire for spices, cause not only do spices make things taste good, but you wanna put down here next to number two, that spices, spices 
were used to preserve. Spices were used to preserve. But we do have some of, sorry, some problems of the old trade system in the Indian Ocean Network. And some of these we kind of touched on before. One, the Muslims controlled supply. So if the Muslims control supply and the Europeans want it, they have to go through the Muslims in order to get whatever goods that they want. And the Muslims then can trade, or sorry, can charge whatever it is that they want to, to the Europeans, and the Europeans are going to pay it. On top of this, Venice was a chief intermediary for trade in Alexandra, and other states are going to resent it. I mean, the Venetians are going to make a huge amount of money because they're going to serve as the middlemen. So a lot of these European nations are trying to find a way around these land routes that the Ottomans and the Venetians have a, num- uh, sorry, have a monopoly over. So then what they can do is then get access to those exact same goods that the Venetians and Ottomans are selling, sell them for a little bit lower in price, make a profit while kind of hosing over both the Venetians and Muslims and kind of forcing them out of business. On top of this, there's also a constant trade deficit with Asia. And what this means, in case you don't know, is is that the Europeans are buying more from the Asian countries than they're selling. A lot of this is, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, a lot of this is, you know, a combination of the fact that some empires such as the Chinese don't believe that the Europeans really have anything worthwhile um, and that, you know, all the stuff that the Europeans have is 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 junk and that the Chinese are a little bit more, uh, you know, above what the Europeans offer. And realistically, the Europeans really don't have any good stuff. They don't have anything of the quality or the diversity or really anything that interests a lot of these Asian markets. Now, spoiler alert, they will find some things later. And extra spoiler alert, it's going to be a drug. But we'll get to that here in a couple chapters. Now, like we sort of started to go over with last chapter, the Portuguese are going to be the first European power to kind of break into the trade that is going on within the Indian Ocean via ocean trade, via sea trade rather than the land trade. And one of the reasons why they go into the Indian Ocean is because the Indian Ocean commerce here was highly rich and very diverse. In the Indian Ocean trade, you have obviously not just simply the Indians, the Mughals trading there, but you have the Ottomans trading there. You have the Chinese. You have some Southeast Asian markets that are starting to get open to you. And you also have some trading empires on the East Coast of Africa. So there is a lot of potential wealth and a lot of potential economic connections that can be made within the Indian Ocean. But Just like the Europeans in general, the Portuguese did not have goods of equality for effective competition. So it's not like they have really cool stuff that the people within the Indian Ocean market are going to be like, ooh, hey, we want that. Instead, the Portuguese are going to turn to piracy. They basically like start essentially like boat jacking people. And the reason for this, or the reason why they're able to do this, is is that the Portuguese ships are simply more maneuverable, and they also carry cannons. Now, granted, the ships aren't very, very big, but they're really, really fast, and they can turn very quickly, where a lot of the other ships that the Ottomans in particular have, and some of the Mughal mariners have, are big kind of lumbering vessels. And on top of this, the Portuguese have cannons. Now, granted, they're not great. You could probably pick one of these things up, one of these cannonballs up, and probably, you know, hoofed it, throw it further than some of these cannons can shoot it. But when no one else has something that goes boom, even something that's craptastic is going to have uh, an impact. 
What the Portuguese ultimately create here is something known as the, as a trade post empire, where their goal is commerce, not territories or populations. You want to go ahead because this is going to be a difference uh, going forward. You want to put a star here by A. So the thing is, is, is that honestly, they know that they're not strong enough to control great, big, huge hunks of land. What they want to do is to simply go and control the trade that's going on there to try to reap the economic benefits rather than investing time and effort and resources like, you know, soldiers, that type of stuff in order con to control these vast areas in which they're outnumbered and simply in, in a lot of ways outgunned. At the height of this trade post empire, they're going to control about half of the spice trade going to Europe, which, you know, all things considered, is really pretty impressive. The Portuguese gradually are going to assimilate into Indian Ocean trade goods, and um, they're going to make a lot of their money. We'll talk about this again with a couple other countries later on. They're going to make a lot of their money in something known as the carrying trade, where they basically behave as though they're a 17th century version of like UPS or FedEx. That if you want something transported from one part of the Indian Ocean to another part of the Indian Ocean, you're going to do it on Portuguese vessels. However, their trading post empire is going to be in steep decline by 1600. And this is going to be linked to something else. So you want to put down here next to C underneath number five. You want to put down because they were in decline. Because they were in decline. By the time the 17th century rolls around, just real quick info, Portugal as a nation is in decline. In fact, there's going to be a period of time where the Portuguese crown and the Spanish crown are going to be held by the same person. And you're going to kind of see here after the 1600s or by the middle of the 1600s, the Portuguese really aren't necessarily a big name. I mean, they'll hold on to some things. They'll have Brazil and they'll have some trading posts, but they're not going to be the force like they were at this time. With the Spanish, again, you know, remember exactly how competitive the European nations are with one another. So as soon as one country fades out, another country is going to start to come in. And as Portugal kind of starts to hit the skids a little bit, the Spanish are going to start to come into this area of Asian trade. So Spain is going to be the first to challenge Portugal's control of this Asian trade. And what they end up doing here, and, and it's incredibly bright, is, is that they establish, sorry, they establish a Spanish base in the Philippines. Um, and they do this for a couple of reasons. One, the Philippines are organized into small competitive chiefdoms, so it's going to work really, really well. In fact, there's going to be a lot of similarities between what the Spanish do here and what they did in the Americas. So a lot of divide and conquer is going to go on. Another thing is, is that no one is really interested in the Philippines. I mean, the Philippines doesn't have any, you know, fantastic natural resources that made the other European countries go, ooh, got to have that. So ultimately here, the Spaniards are going to be able to establish full colonial rule here. Takeover is going to occur between 1565 and 1650. Again, you know, they have a lot of different groups that they kind of have to like slowly but surely pick off. And the Philippines, by the way, are going to remain a Spanish ter colonial territory until just about the turn of the 20th century, when after the Spanish-American War, the United States is going to gain control. Another big thing here with the Philippines is, is that we have a major missionary campaign that's going to be launched here. And ultimately, the Filipino society is going to be the only major Christian outpost within Asia. And you want to go ahead and put a star here by number three, because that's going to be a big deal. Because as especially Southeast Asia is becoming more and more Islamic as traders and wandering holy men come into the area and start to convert people here in the Philippines. 
Again, a lot of the same things are going to go on here that went on in the New World of the Americas. We're also going to make it a major Catholic uh, outpost here within the area. And again, you know, the Spaniards are going to be introducing forced relocation, tribute taxes, unpaid labor. Again, like I've been saying, you want to put down here next to number four right here. You want to put, please, similar to what they did in the Americas, similar to what they did in the Americas. Because of this, and you'll see the usefulness of the Philippines a little bit later, Manila is going to become a major center with a diverse population. There's going to be a lot of groups coming in because of the economic opportunity that is going to be contained within the Philippines. Now, with the Dutch and the English, we have something a little bit different going on than what we had with the Portuguese and with the Spanish. One, the Dutch and the English have some personal problems, let's just say, and it causes them to enter the Indian Ocean commerce arena a little bit later than the Spanish and the Portuguese, where the Dutch and English are going to both going to enter the Indian Ocean commerce in the early 17th century. And again, they're going to both displace the Portuguese because, again, you know, the Portuguese are really sort of kind of on their last legs and they will be incredibly competitive with one another. In fact, you want to put down here next to B underneath number one. Just put it right here. Do you want to put this brings about this brings about anti-Dutch legislation in England. This brings about anti-Dutch legislation in England. Now, what's going to make these countries different than what we see with Portugal and with Spain is about 1600. Both the Dutch and English are going to organize private trading companies to handle Indian Ocean trade. Now, what makes this unique, and I'm going to explain what a private trading company is. You want to put this down here next to number two. And this is kind of a medium-sized note, so you probably want to run it down the side here. You should have plenty of space, and we don't have another note here for a couple minutes. So do you want to put, please, here again, like I said, right next to number two, private trading companies, private trading companies, get charters from the monarch, get charters from the monarch, and then put in parentheses, they pay for them. And they also get a monopoly on trade there. They also get a monopoly on trade there. With the Portuguese and Spain. With the Portuguese and Spain. The governments own the companies. The governments own the companies. So with these Dutch and English private trading companies, what's happening is that they are selling stock in these trading companies. So individuals can buy into this and it kind of disperses the risk. So if the company goes belly up, there's a whole bunch of people or there's a number of people that are kind of taking the financial burden. But there's also going to be a bunch of people that are also going to reap the financial rewards as well. So like I said, the merchants are going to invest and they're going to share the risks. The Dutch and British India companies were chartered by their respective governments. So a charter will allow these companies to exist. It kind of gives them government approval, government permission. And they're going to have to pay a certain fee for that charter, for that permission. 
in exchange, that charter is going to give them a couple things. One, it's going to give them a monopoly on trade. So like no other British company other than the British East India Company is going to be able to trade in the East Indies. Same thing with the British West India Trading Company. No other British company is going to be able to trade in that particular part of the world. The government also is going to get some, let's just say some financial kickbacks. So like if there is a situation in which the government needs money, needs a loan, they're going to be able to go to these trading companies and request these loans that realistically are probably never going to be paid back. The other, and this is a big, big privilege or a big right that these Dutch and British companies get, is they basically can kind of behave like a government within these conquered people. So they had the power to make war and to govern conquered people. You want to put a star here by C because this is a big, important power. You're going to see that especially the British East India Company, they're not necessarily going to handle this power really, really well. So ultimately, both of these countries are going to establish their own trade post empires. Again, very similar to what the Portuguese do. Neither the British nor the Dutch are going to be strong enough to kind of control or to create any type of a formal colony. And because they're competitive with one another, ultimately, the Dutch are going to focus on Indonesia and the English are going to focus on India. With the Dutch East India Company here, they're going to control both the shipping and production of cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, and mace. And by the way, mace, this is the outer hull of the nutmeg where you take it off, you dry it, and you can grate it down just like you do with nutmeg. And it's going to have um, a slightly less pungent flavor. It's going to be a more mild uh, type of flavor to it. Um, and again, you know, all of these are going to be luxury spices. These guys are going to, sorry, seize small spice producing islands and force the people only to sell to the Dutch. What they end up doing is destroying the local economy of the Spice Islands, but it's going to make the Dutch rich. In general, you want to put over here, over on the side, you want to put down that the Dutch will become known for their brutality. The Dutch will become known for their brutality. What they basically do here is they know that there is a lot of value and a lot of wealth to be made with the growing, selling, and trading of cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, and maize. So what they do in Indonesia is they force everybody to grow only these spices. They are not allowed to grow anything else. Anything else that the Indonesians need, the Dutch claim that they'll provide, and they don't do a really great job of this. Then what they do is, is that they force the Indonesians to pay a tax that's payable only in cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, and mace. So then the Dutch are basically getting these highly desired goods essentially for free. Then they're selling them at a profit, and you know the Indonesians end up getting screwed out of the whole deal. Now, with the British East India Company, this is going to be weird to say because the British ultimately are going to become this massive colonial powerhouse. But at this time, they're not as well financed or as commercially sophisticated as the Dutch. So they couldn't break into the Spice Islands. So what they have to do, and you want to put down here next to A underneath number five, you want to put down they settled for India. They settled for India. They don't really have the ability for a variety of reasons, including in the 17th century. Again, they're kind of dealing with some personal issues internally. They can't really go and challenge the Dutch toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So what they have to do is they have to go to a less desirable, but ultimately long-term, more profitable area of uh, India. Eventually here... The British Navy is going to gain control of the Arabian Sea and Persian Gulf. And again, you know, 
the Europeans in general, but here the English specifically, are not as strong as some of these empires that they're coming into contact with. So they're not going to be able to compete with the Mughal Empire on land. In fact, you want to put down here next to D, underneath number five, you want to put down that they will wait until Mughal power fragments. They will wait until Mughal power fragments. So here's the thing. The British, this future powerhouse of colonies and ruler of India, spoiler alert, actually need to ask permission from the Mughal rulers for them to even trade and to do business there. Ultimately, the Mughals, and we'll deal with why here a little bit later, the Mughals are going to kind of get on the struggle bus here, and they're going to start to fragment. And as soon as they start to fragment, the English are going to come in, and they're going to do what the Europeans have done before and will continue to do, just simply go and divide and conquer. For the Britons here in India are going to trade pepper and other spices, but cotton textiles are going to become more important. And for a long time, it's going to be these cotton textiles that are going to really be what makes India so incredibly profitable for the British. The British and also the, the Dutch, rather, um, are also going to become involved in the carrying trade within Asia. And again, this is something that the Portuguese had, sorry, had also participated in. But you want to put down here next to number six. Just put down Think FedEx. Think FedEx. That again, they're pretty much going to be the country that if you need something shipped throughout this Asian trading network, you put it on a Dutch ship or you put it on an English ship. Now, here's the thing. Even though it seems as though we've been taking a lot in this section and talking about the Europeans and what they're doing and how they're doing it, and it seems as though the Europeans kind of are coming and kicking butt and taking names, the reality here is, is that European presence was much less significant in Asia than in the Americas or Africa. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, the Europeans were no real military threat to Asia. I mean, in reality, and I've said this before, but you want to get down here next to number two, is, is that the Europeans are still behind. The Europeans are still behind. And honestly, they don't have any, you know, kick button, take names type of technology. They don't have any type of technological edge on these Asian empires versus what they had on the Americas. Just to give you an idea here uh, with Japan. So the Portuguese reached Japan in the mid 16th century. So the mid 17th century. Now here's the thing. Japan was having some personal problems. At the time, they're divided by constant conflicts amongst the feudal lords who are going to be supported by the samurai. At first, the Europeans were welcome. I mean, you know, there's a lot of good things that the Europeans bring. They bring some goods. They bring money. You know, they're willing to buy Japanese goods that are going to help to continue to fund a lot of this, you know, inner feudal type of fighting. However, ultimately here, Japan is going to unify politically under the Tokugawa Shogun in the early 17th century. And this is going to be a game changer for the European relationship with Japan. The Tokugawa shoguns are going to increasingly regard Japan as a threat to their unity because they are. I mean, the Europeans gained a lot of wealth and a lot of advantage by sort of kind of playing off these divided feudal lords. They were almost able to play sort of kind of like, let's make a deal. Like, oh, hey, you want this stuff? Well, your next door neighbor who you're trying to beat the crap out of also kind of wants this stuff. And we might be willing to kind of make a better deal with you. You know, so there's a lot of back and forth going on here. 
So because there is going to be this obsession with attempting to protect this newly created, newly recreated unity of Japan or for Japan, the Japanese are going to be barred from traveling abroad. By the way, this is going to be something similar we're going to see in China here as well. And the Europeans are also banned, except for the Dutch, which are going to be able to sell at a single site. And the reason here for the Dutch being able to still trade, and you want to put down here next to a small Roman numeral four, just put down because the Dutch are only interested in trade. The Dutch are only interested in trade. Some of the other European countries that the Japanese had contact with during this period of civil war, before the Tokugawa shogunate came in, is they're interested in doing business, but they're also interested in converting as many Japanese to Christianity as they possibly can. I mean, you know, remember the three G's of glory, God, and gold. So, you know, God is going to be a big part of the European behavior in a lot of these connections within Asia. And since the Dutch aren't really interested in that, all they want to do is make money, the Tokugawa shoguns will still continue to allow the Dutch to trade at a single specific trading site. And that's it. Nobody else. So if you want some Chinese goods, you're going to, sorry, if you want some Japanese goods, rather, you're going to end up having to go through Dutch traders in order to get it. Eventually here, Japan is going to be closed off from Europe from 1650 to 1850. Ultimately, and you want to put a little note here next to Ian number three, do you want to put please that the growth of the West, the growth of the West will force the Japanese to change. The growth of the West will force the, sorry, the Japanese to change. In general here, Asian merchants continue to operate uh, despite European presence. I mean, it's sort of kind of business as usual. We just happen to have Europeans there. And in fact, overland trade within Asia is going to remain in Asian hands. In fact, you want to put a star here by A underneath number four. The simple fact is that, again, a lot of this trade going on in Asia is business as usual. The Asian merchants and traders just continue to do what they always have done. There's just a little bit more of a European presence there. 